Hello, welcome to the lecture on Geographic Information Systems and this lecture will be talking about Georeferencing and Projection Transformations. In this lecture, we will be recalling the concept of projections, we will be talking about what Georeferencing is and then finally, we will talk about some projection transformations. So, let me recall before you that it's a 3D world, it's a three-dimensional world, it has got X and Y and Z coordinates. So therefore, <clears throat> whatever data is available, it's in 3D. But the media which we use to present our maps is in 2D. So it's a sheet of paper which is in 2D. So from 3D, we have to transform the data into a 2D media. A 2D medium. So for example, if I've got 3D data, I have to put it on the screen. So I have to have a mathematical transformation. Now this mathematical transformation is called projection. Now there are three core types of projections. Uh, three core types, it depends on, you can see on the right side of the screen that there will be three types of surfaces that we can use. So those surfaces are cylindrical, conical or azimuthal. So the flattenable surface as we can see the flattenable surface it is written here. Uh, that is what we call the azimuthal surface. The conical surface is a cone surrounding the earth. A cylindrical surface is a cylinder surrounding the earth. So <coughs> these are the three kinds of surfaces that we use for our projections. Now each projection has a different kind of behavior. You can see there is what we call as a Lambert cylindrical projection, so where we use <coughs> cylinders. And in general, the all cylindrical projections are known as the Mercator's projection. And you can see also here that cylindrical projections, how they look like, the conical projections, how they look like, and the azimuthal projections, how they look like. Now this categorization, the subcategorization basically, it is based on the source of light. So if the source of light is coming from infinity, we call it the orthographic projection. Any kind of surface, so for example, if it's a conical surface, we call it orthographic conical. If we assume that the source of light is coming from a single point, we call it stereographic. Then there is centrographic. What is the difference between stereographic and centrographic? The source of light is on the surface of the Earth's model. Whereas in centrographic, the source of light is in the center of the Earth's model. So look, look here. In, in a, if the source of light is coming from infinity, for example, the sun, it is known as orthographic. If the source of light is coming from the opposite side of the Earth's surface, we call it stereographic. And if the source of light is located in the center, we call it centrographic. So these are the various uh, categorizations based on uh, the source of light. Now, uh, you can see here on this sheet that the type of cylinder, that uh, type of surface that we are using is a cone here. So orthographic conical, stereographic conical, centrographic conical. So these are the conical surfaces. So similarly, if we have got the cylinder there, then it will be orthographic cylindrical, stereographic cylindrical, centrographic cylindrical in that way. Now, when we are talking about any projection, you can see here, when you are talking about any projection, it's written equal area. And what is equal area? It means if I am projecting from a three-dimensional surface to a two-dimensional surface, the actual area of the particular object on the ground. Say for example, if I have got an agricultural field. If I, now, it is on the, it's, it's on the earth's surface and it's in 3D. If I am going to project it on a map, the area of the object is not going to change. So, the, whatever the area of the, you know, agricultural field, is there the same area is going to be preserved in the map 
Of course, with the scale, of course, with the scale. Now, a type of the cylindrical projection is called the universal transverse marketer projection. So, what is this transverse marketer? The marketer projections are cylindrical. You can, uh, <coughs> a, a marketer projections are cylindrical. So, you can see if the cylinder is vertical, that is called typically a marketer's projection. However, the problem with the vertical cylinder is that the catchment area of the cylinder. Now, the, you know that the earth is an oblate spheroid. If I use a cylindrical projection with a cylinder which is vertical, there will be more distortions on them. So, what people thought about is we will put the cylinder horizontally and if you put the cylinder horizontally, it is called the universe, it is called the transverse marketer. Now, in the universal transverse marketer, what we do is we divide this entire area of the entire surface of the earth into six degree zones. So, what are these six degree zones? It is from minus 180 degree west to 180, uh, 174 degree west. So, this is zone number one. And then again from 174 degree west to say for example 168 degree west that will be zone number two and so and so forth you can see that in this particular map which is shown on the screen the entire earth's earth's area is divided into the surface area is divided into zones and there will be 60 zones okay so from zone number one to zone number 60 now, if I am in Aurangabad, Aurangabad, we know that it is in the northern hemisphere. Aurangabad's latitude longitude extends, say that it is in zone number 43 and it will be in the northern hemisphere. So, therefore, if I have to say UTM zone 43N is suitable for Aurangabad, then I would be correct. So, Aurangabad is located in zone number 43 and in the northern hemisphere. So, it is zone 43N. Now, the properties of projections that we are talking about, there are three properties basically. So, distance preserving, area preserving and shape preserving. Which property we choose to preserve depends on the kind of application that we want to do. Say for example, if I want to preserve distances, what application I am focusing on? I am focusing on a taxi driver's application. A taxi has to travel from point number A to point number B. And therefore, the taxi driver is interested what distance have I covered. That is, that is there we have the requirement of a distance preserving projection. Area preserving projection. Why do I need an area preserving projection? A farmer will be interested in how much land I have. So, therefore, I will read or need an area preserving position. A shape preserving position. Why do I need a shape preserving position? I want to preserve the shape because of my political reasons. So, uh, if I want to preserve the shape, I want to preserve the area, I want to preserve the distance, I cannot preserve all of them together. This is very much important here. I cannot preserve all of these things together. Now, what happens in a GIS that I procure data sets from multiple sources. And I'm typically remember that the topic of the lecture here is not projections, but we are talking about georeferencing here. So our issues in a GIS and we have to what we have to do is in a GIS I have to procure data from various agencies. One, I might choose to procure data from ISRO, I might choose to procure data from USGS, I might choose to procure, procure data from Survey of India. Now each individual agency has a different data projection. Each individual agency uses a different projection system because of its own protocols so what we what any gis engineer has to do 
is to bring them into the same system. That is the requirement of a GIS. It has to bring them, a user, a GIS engineer, has to bring everything into the same coordinate system. So, people create data based on personal knowledge. They, uh, they have personal knowledge or systems or literature available. The data is based on ancillary or historic data sets. The historic data sets might have been created from some other things. So we have to bring them into the same system and this particular thing, bringing them into the same system is known as georeferencing. So what do I do in georeferencing is I attach a geographic information to whatever data I have. So some data might have geographic information already attached to it and some data may not have geographic information attached to it. We will come across this later. But what kind of data we get? We see. We can get satellite remote sensing data. So some satellite remote sensing data serving agencies are already assigning a geographic information and giving it to us. But some agencies they don't attach it. So satellite remote sensing data. Then polygon, point and line data. So now this data is obtained from Survey of India map. So I scan the map. So whenever I scan the map, I do not have any geographic information attached to it. I have to attach. That's an additional requirement, additional procedure that we anybody has to do. Any GIS engineer has to attach a geographic information to any data that he wants to use in a GIS. So the coordinates become, when we attach a geographic information to any data set, the data set coordinates become geographic coordinates. When I say geographic coordinates, it means that it becomes the coordinates of the earth. So those coordinates are on a spheroid. So the spheroid, let me recall, spheroid is basically a model of the earth surface. So it's a mathematical model of the earth surface. And again, since these coordinates are geographic and geography as we understand is represented on paper so these are all projected coordinates so when i say attach projection information it means i attach the name of the projection and the parameters of the projection and when i say projection there are two things that we have to remember one is called the spheroid which is meant for x and y coordinates and the next one is called the datum, which is for the Z coordinates. And remember that when I say datum, it is used for measuring my Z coordinate. When I say spheroid, it is used for measuring my X and Y coordinates. So this part is called the georeferencing. Now there is a particular standard procedure for doing georeferencing in any GIS software. Now whenever I am doing georeferencing, I will encounter certain errors and those errors might be manual they might be mistakes and they might be mistakes in the source of the data but we'll take a bit of digression here and we'll talk about the method of least squares so basic uh, least squares example is a regression example so in a regression example what happens a uh, uh, lot of points are given and what we have to do is to fit a straight line and this straight line fit, uh, and whenever, whenever I'm talking about a straight line, a straight line has two parameters. One is the slope and the intercept. So these are called the parameters of the straight, straight line. So if I change the slope or the intercept, slope and or the intercept of the straight line, what happens is the straight line changes. So these are the parameters of the straight line. So in a regression uh, method that we conduct, the regression method minimizes the squares of errors and as a result, we fit a straight line. So you, not only straight line, I can fit a parabola, I can fit a cubic and I can fit any polynomial. In fact, I can choose to fit any curve based, based on whatever geometric model I have. Now, incidentally, it turns out that if I convert my fitting problem into a matrix problem. So uh, when I say matrix problem, typically the transformation becomes. And when I say transformation, why I'm talking about a transformation? It's a transformation because I am going to convert from 3D coordinates to 2D coordinates. So
So this is an affine transformation. An affine transformation consists of one matrix which is A and another matrix is called T. So what is A? A means it's the, it's the matrix which can handle rotation, scaling and shearing. Okay? And the, and the T matrix will handle translation. So as a standard georeferencing for problem is for a given set of source and target coordinator, coordinates. See, as in the line fitting problem, what is what is given is you uh, the, the points are given to you, and you have to determine the parameters of the line that is M and C. Here in the georeferencing problem, for a given sets of source and target coordinates, the parameters of A and T. When I say parameters of A and T, you can see on the screen there is A11, A12, A21, A22, T1 and T2. How many parameters are there? There are six unknown parameters which we have to determine. When I say six unknown parameters, it means that I have to have six algebraic equations, at least six algebraic equations to solve that problem. Now, if I have more than six algebraic equations, I will use the method of least squares. So, if I transform my georeferencing problem into a least squares problem and, and my least squares problem into a matrix based problem, it becomes easier to determine what my parameters of the affine transformation are. So, when I say parameters of the affine transformation, I am going to remind you that I am talking about A11, A12, A21, A22, T1 and T2. So, here the new coordinates are known to me. And the old coordinates are known to me. What are old coordinates? Old coordinates are my, the coordinates of my scanned map. For example, if I have scanned a topo sheet, those are those will be containing my old coordinates. And what are the new coordinates? The new coordinates are my earth coordinates. This is what we are talking about. So how do I do geofence? So suppose for example, uh, I have I have some map which is scanned by, uh, scanned by somebody. It's a town planning map. It is created by the town planning department of mm, the municipality corporation. And I, I don't have any idea what, is the, what will be the coordinates. But it has got, in my town planning map, there are certain landmarks. So what do I have to do? I take a GPS. I take a GPS. You can have a GPS on your mobile also. And I will go for field survey. I can also take topographic sheets and obtain the same landmark points which are there. Of course, the topographic sheet has to be recent. Otherwise, I will have to take a GPS and go to that point, locate that point, use Google Earth, go to that point or locate that point, and then use the same coordinate in my georeferencing. So that point which I use for georeferencing they are called the control points for the uh, georeferencing procedure. So these are called GCPs or ground control points. So I have to establish, the, remember the algorithm is this. So I have to establish the mathematical model of the, between the two. So my mathematical model can be a linear model, can be a quadratic model, can be a cubic model or whatever model I use, remember that the number of equations that are required in a model that will be depending upon the number of the, so the number of GCPs do I, that I require in a model that will be affecting or that will depend on the degree of the polynomial. So please understand the number of GCPs are determined by the degree of polynomial that you choose to use in a georeferencing. In a georeferencing, I can very well choose to have a quadratic model, I can very well choose to have a cubic model. But also remember that if I use a cubic model or a quadratic model, what I am going to do is I am going to make the model more complicated. Any linear system is always the simplest system. The more the complication, the more the higher the degree of the polynomial, that is going to be more complicated. Okay. So, uh, the, there are mm, uh, 
different kinds of data in a GIS. In a GIS, I use image data, they are called raster data as per terminology. So raw satellite data can be georeferenced using the georeferencing algorithm. So that it's an image. So if I have to georeference it, I use the algorithm which is present in most GIS software. I can uh, georeference the raw satellite data. And vector data. What are vector data? Vector data basically point, line, polygon. That is what vector data means. And they can be used using the another georeferencing algorithm. So in the georeferencing algorithm, there is an image georeferencing algorithm and the raster georeferencing, uh, sorry, vector georeferencing algorithm. Raster, raster georeferencing is used for your uh, image layers and your vector georeferencing used for vector layers. Okay. So in an information system, I my problem is to handle multi-source data in a single information system. So what I have to do is to use projection transformation. What please understand again this this particular thing you can understand again. What do I mean to say a projection transformation and a data transformation? You see what is happening is that when I talk about projection transformation, the survey of India maps are represented are represented in the latitude and longitude. All right. When you are talking about town planning map, they are in the local system. That means a local plane table based system. Whereas when we are talking about a GPS, when we are talking about a GIS, though they are in a projection system. So in a projection system, I am talking about UTM, WGS84. This is what we are talking about. What, when we are talking about the projection system, we talk about UTM as the, uh, the spheroid, all right? So when you are talking about UTM, so that's the projection system. And when I say WJ84, that is my spheroid, also my datum. So in many cases, what has happened is the topographic survey done by British India. What happened is they did the topographic survey, calculated all heights with respect to the mean sea level but in modern terminology in modern mapping every map has to be prepared using wj 74 so what do i have to do i have to bring the wj 74 map into the new uh, i have to bring the msl map which is an existing height map msl i have to bring it to the wj 74 that is that part is called the data transformation what is projection transformation? If my map is in latitude longitude, I have to bring it into UTM. So this is called the projection transformation. So what? So how do I do projection transformation? And how do I do datum transformation? There are three things here. Now X, Y, and Z. So basically, now we are going to do an affine transformation with many more parameters. You can see right there in the yellow mark, mark yellow, it is now A11, A12, A13 up to A33. So these are 9 and you are seeing T1, T2, T3. These are 3 more. So 9 plus 3, those are 12 parameters. So to coordinate, to conduct a projection transformation including my height, I will need my initial vector. I will need the translation coordinates. I will need 3 rotation angles. I need 1 scaling factor. So technically, this is called a Helmer transformation. So for a datum transformation, they are typically done with the curvilinear coordinates, latitude, longitude and height. So this is how it is done. So there will be a slight change in the latitude, there will be slight change in the longitude and there will be slight change in the height. Remember that, always remember that the datum transformation is immediately required because you can see you can go to the railway station of any particular city and you will find out that there will be a difference in the GPS site and there will be a difference in the, uh, there will be a difference between the GPS coordinates and the GPS height obtained through GPS and the MSL height which is there on the railway station then 
this datum transformation is done through the Molodensky transformation. So we'll revise once more. So projection transformation is done through the Helmert transformation. That's the Helmert transformation I'm talking about. And the datum transformation is done through the Molodensky transformation. You have to remember these things.